I've spoken at length on the first way of financing our needs through taxes or recurrent needs. Let me now move on to the second way, which is borrowing. Borrowing is a reasonable option for long-lived capital investments with high capital expenses because the benefits of these assets are enjoyed mainly by future generations, in fact, many years down the road. This is an option that we are pursuing for major long-term projects like Changi Terminal 5. Ms. Ting Pei Ling and Mr. Saktiandi Supat raised concerns about whether borrowing will result in unsustainable debts and interest payments. And they have raised an important point. Indeed, we aim to live within our means. We should not over-borrow and burden future generations with unsustainable debt, as we have seen in other countries. The stark difference is that unlike some other countries, we borrow not to spend on recurrent needs like healthcare, education and security, but to invest in long-term infrastructure. Such long-term investments will continue to yield economic benefits and position Singapore well for the future. We are strategically leveraging the strength of our financial position to optimise our borrowing. To reduce financing costs, the government is considering the provision of guarantees to back borrowings by our statutory boards and government-owned companies. The government is consulting the President's Office and the Council of Presidential Advisers on this proposal, including the details of how it will be structured. So many of the points that Mr. Saktandi mentioned earlier on will be discussed in great detail. Now this way, we can tap on the government's AAA credit rating and the strength of our reserves without directly using it. This is how we are helping the current and future generations. And we're able to do so only because we have planned our finances soundly and accumulated strong reserves. We are one of only 11 countries in the world, one of 11 countries in the world, and the only Asian country which have a AAA credit rating, which represents the solid foundation and safety nets that our forefathers left for us. We do not and cannot take our credit rating for granted. I'm glad that members like Mr. Sito Ipin, Mr. Liang Eng Hua, and Mr. Hong Teng Kun think that this is a sensible approach and recognize value in this. Now, I'll talk about a third way we've been financing our needs, which is our reserves. Our reserves have been painstakingly built up over half a century by our pioneers and previous generations. We have inherited this nest egg and must act as responsible stewards. That is why over the years, we have carefully deliberated and developed a comprehensive set of rules to safeguard and manage the use of reserves. Our constitutional rules protect our financial assets and land as past reserves. As land sales convert fiscal assets into financial assets, the proceeds from land sales are rightly fully protected as past reserves as well. This principle of asset conversion is sound. It is irresponsible to mislead people that the principle suddenly doesn't apply when we use just, say, 20% instead of 100% of land sale proceeds. Mr. Pritam Singh made such a suggestion, and if I may use an analogy, suppose our forefathers left us with five plots of land, and each year we sell one plot, 20%, and use that money. In five years, there'll be no land left. So that is the fallacy of using 20%. Now, instead of using the proceeds of land sales, or any part of it, for spending, the proceeds of land sales are added to our reserves, which are invested in a globally diversified portfolio. From the returns, we take 50% as NIRC to supplement our budgetary needs. 
This achieves a balance between the supporting the needs of the current and future generations. Today, contributions from reserves are already the largest contributor to our revenues. If we did not introduce the NIR framework, we would have had to double our personal income tax collection or our GST collection to raise the same amount of revenues. And yet some have suggested increasing the NRRC spending cap from a current 50 to 60% or using a portion of land sale proceeds for recurrent social spending. All this sounds very tempting. It seems relatively painless to do so compared to raising taxes. And you may be wondering why do I not take a painless way? But is it the right thing to do? Certainly not. The rules on reserves were debated and agreed in this house. We enshrined them in the Constitution. We deliberately introduced rules on land sales and a 50% NIRC cap so that we do not succumb to the temptation to draw more from our reserves to fund current expenditure or eat into the principal sum. To amend the rules as a first resort is ill-disciplined and unwise. This would defeat the purpose of enshrining the 50% cap in our constitution. Moreover, if as soon as we need more money, the first thing we do is to relax the rules, that is the surest way to change Singapore's basic orientation. From saving and building for the future to living for today and letting tomorrow look after itself. We must not give in to the temptation to chip away at our strategic national assets.